I watched the video of the front foot elevated split squat shift for driving uh, supination and calcaneal inversion. Does this happen as a result of femoral internal rotation, tibial external rotation, and supination and calcaneal inversion? Would this line of thinking be correct? If so, I'm having a tough time wrapping my head around the fact that femoral IR, an exhalation measure, would bias supination, which is an inhalation measure, further down the chain. Would it be possible to clarify? Yes, it would. So when I am bending the knee and straightening the knee, you actually have opposing rotations happening with that particular movement. So as I flex the knee, and there's some slight differences in the range, but generally I'm gonna have more of a bias of tibial IR and femoral ER throughout flexion. And then with extension, I have tibial ER, external rotation, and femoral IR. This is part of the screw home mechanism. It does get a little bit more in depth throughout ranges, and I'll dive into that as we relate this to the split squat. And this is an important point to consider. Generally, people might be thinking that I'm externally rotating or I'm internally rotating at any point in time throughout the range, but both of these rotations and really movements in all directions are occurring simultaneously in order to produce a given motion. There's this, uh, this really hit home for me when I was reading the, uh, this book on hand therapy. It's like I think it's like Rehabilitation of the Elbow, Wrist, and Hand. It's an awesome book. I'll link it in the show notes. It's, it's a really hard read because it's a French translation, but it's the best biomechanics book of all time when it comes to um, things, elbow and wrist. Like, awesome. You got to check it out. But they talked about the difference between the first and second carpal rows as I'm flexing and extending the, the, the wrist. And... When I flex the wrist, flexion is associated with pronation of the first carpal row and supination of the second carpal row. And the cancellation out of these two rotations promotes what appears to be a sagittal plane motion. The reverse is true when it comes to extension. With wrist extension, I have supination of the first carpal row and pronation of the second carpal row. These offset rotations give us the appearance of a pure sagittal plane motion at the wrist, but it is only in appearance. The same thing happens at the knee joint. When I flex and I extend, based on the screw home mechanism among other things, I have rotation occurring in opposing directions. And that's what gives me the appearance at the knee joint of a purely sagittal motion. But it is as far from sagittal plane action as can be. As I'm going through the range, if I start in knee hyperextension, I have tibial external rotation and femoral internal rotation. As I initially flex the knee and I unhinge out the screw home mechanism, I have tibial internal rotation and femoral external rotation. And then here's the critical piece when we relate this to the split squat. Once I hit 30 to 90 degrees of uh, knee flexion, I have tibial external rotation and femoral internal rotation happening again. And this is one of the reasons why at 90 degrees of knee flexion, I have the largest compressive forces in the knee joint and the patellofemoral complex. That's why squatting parallel can sometimes be problematic for knee, uh, knee, knee pain. And here's the cool thing about this. If I flex the knee beyond ATG, so I'm going all the way down thigh to calf, I actually have a reduction of compressive forces through the knee joint, and I have a, a maximal amount of tibial internal rotation and femoral external rotation occurring. And that's the differences that we see in rotation in the knee joint. With something as it's pretty cool because you know when we when we bend our knee and straighten our knee it looks like it's just a hinge but there's these crazy changes in rotation that occur throughout the range in order to make this happen so then how does this relate to foot positioning as i'm descending 
through the split squat. Tibial external rotation is generally going to be paired with calcaneal inversion, which in normal mechanics, you can have compensatory twists. Check out one of the previous debriefs that I did. But when I invert the calcaneus, that's gonna create supination of the foot. External rotation, calcaneal inversion, and supination are paired. And then reverse that. If I internally rotate the tibia, that's going to be paired with calcaneal eversion, which is going to allow for pronation of the foot. So the arch is gonna flatten. Now, let's look at a split squat and how we can have one rotation going one way at the femur, but then something completely different happening at the tibia and the foot. At the start position of the split squat, because I only got a little bit of knee flexion, I got a little bit of hip extension, I'm gonna have a bias towards tibial internal rotation and femoral external rotation. But then remember folks, if the tibia is internally rotating, the foot is going to be pronating and the calcaneus is going to be everting. That doesn't mean that it's completely flat. We're not talking about on-off switches because on-off switches get stitches. I want to keep this chill and it's the direction that we're moving. It's gradients. So it's moving towards eversion and pronation. As I descend into the split squat and I'm approaching the bottom, I get 90 degrees of hip flexion, 90-ish degrees of knee flexion. I'm going to have tibial external rotation and femoral internal rotation. If the tibia is externally rotating, what does that mean going on at the foot? The foot is going to be, guess what, you got it. Calcaneus is inverting and the foot is going to be more supinated. And because of that, you can have a situation where the femur is internally rotating, an exhalation-based measure, but the foot is externally rotating or supinating, which is an inhalation-based measure. And it has to do with the fact that the body doesn't work purely in moving into one rotation versus another. It's not all inhalation or exhalation. It's not all anterior versus posterior expansion. It's not all ER and IR, whatever. Motions can happen simultaneously, and we don't work in these on-off switches when we're moving. The same thing I think is true is, is a commonality when you see someone saying, like, I'm, I'm sympathetically dominant. Dude, I'm sympathetic AF because I'm stressed because of whatever. That's not the way your autonomic nervous system works either, folks. You have sympathetic and parasympathetic influences occurring at all times. And the same thing happens when it comes to differing rotations within your body. So the big key that we're talking about when we relate the femoral rotation and tibial rotation and foot position, folks, is the femur and tibia rotate in opposing directions as I bend and straighten the knee. That influences the foot position. If I'm IRing the femur, that's going to ER the tibia, which is going to supinate the foot. And that creates a link between internal rotation of a femur and supination of the foot. But what doesn't necessarily change, and this is where when we're talking about a lot of this stuff, we utilize axial skeleton as the reference point. Me supinating the foot in that particular situation doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to move towards inhalation or vice versa. Generally, the, the pelvis and femoral strategy are going to work together in that sense.